general functional organization of the nervous system. Nervous system. The nervous system detect the changes in the internal or external environment and it produces response with the endocrine system and it produces response with the endocrine system. Also, it is responsible for production of our behavior, memories and the movement and movement. Why the nervous system can detect changes and produce response as well as production of movement, memories, and behavior because of the excitability of its neurons, because of the property of excitability. What is the meaning of excitability? Excitability means ability to response. And the response on the nervous system is the production of nerve impulse. Is the production of what? Is the production of nerve impulse. So in your skin, you have sensory receptors for the pressure, for vibration, for touch. When these receptors are stimulated, they produce electrical change called the receptor potential. And if this receptor potential is strong enough to reach to the firing level, it will generate action potential in the sensory neuron. It will generate action potential in the sensory neuron. And this action potential or nerve impulse will be conducted to the spinal cord and ascend to the sensory areas in your brain, exciting them, stimulating them, and then your brain or your central nervous system is going to detect the response. It's going to detect what? To detect the response. Functions of the nervous system. Everything done in the nervous system involves three fundamental steps. Number one, Sensory function detects, in, in, detects changes in the internal or external environment or detect internal and external stimuli. Number two, an integrative function, an integrative function, which is meaning to produce analysis and making decision. Number three, motor function motor function or the effector function. So we can summarize the functions of our nervous system is to detect the changes in the internal and external environment. So it acts as a detector. And when the nervous system detect or the receptor detect these changes, they are going to transform these changes into what into nerve impulse so they detect and transform these changes into action potential or nerve impulse conduct this action potential to the nervous tissue or the nervous system and the nervous system is going to produce analysis of this information and detect what is the decision needed then we have the motor function or the production of response the production of response Organization of the nervous system. Over 100 billion million of neurons, over 100 billion of neurons, and 10 to 50 times of that number from supporting cells called neuroglial cells are organized in two main subdivisions. Are organized in the, into two main subdivisions. We have central nervous system located in bony cavities located inside the skull and inside the vertebral column and this is known as the central nervous system central nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord within the central nervous system we have some cell bodies are collected together to form nuclei we have collection of cell bodies inside the central nervous system and we name it as what? As nuclear. Peripheral nervous system includes the cranial nervous and the spinal nerves. We have 12 pairs of cranial nerves and 31 pairs of spinal nerves. These nerves, which include the cranial and spinal nerves, forming the peripheral nervous system. And this nervous, which produce either somatic function or autonomic function, has collection of cell bodies, has collection of cell bodies, and the collection of cell bodies is known as what? Is known as 
ganglia is known as ganglia so the ganglia the ganglia are collection of cell buds present outside the central nervous system collection of cell buds outside the central nervous system and in this condition this for example we have here the autonomic ganglia or the sympathetic chain that is formed of collection of cell buds or the site of synapse between the preganglionic neurons and postganglionic neurons in the autonomic nervous system or in the sympathetic nervous system. Functional organization of the nervous system. The nervous system can be classified physiologically into somatic nervous system, autonomic nervous system, enteric nervous system. Somatic nervous system, it is a part of the nervous system that produces regulation of skeletal muscles. It receives somatic motor neurons or somatic efferents, and these somatic efferents are arising from the brain and spinal cord. From the spinal cord, they are arising from the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord, and from the brain, it is arising from the somatic motor nuclei of the brain stem. From the somatic motor nuclei of the brain stem. And this somatic nervous system is concerned also with the perception of the sensation of the sensation from sensory receptors located in the skin and subcutaneous tissue from the skin and subcutaneous tissue so what's going we are controlling the activity of skeletal muscle by somatic motor neurons or somatic efferents arising from the brain and the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord and also the somatic nervous system receives the somatic sensation receives somatic sensation then we have another nervous system which is the involuntary nervous system or the nervous system that controls the activity of viscera that supply smooth muscle, cardiac muscle and the glands and it has the autonomic motor neurons or autonomic efferents which may be either sympathetic or parasympathetic and if we remember the sympathetic is soracolumbar the meaning of soracolumbar it has its origin from the lateral horn cells of the spinal cord from thoracic segment thoracic 1 to thoracic 12 and the lumbar 1 and 2 parasympathetic is craniosacral arising from the brain stem and also from the sacral segments in the spinal cord sacral 2 3 and 4 these nerves either the sympathetic and the parasympathetic are controlling or regulating or modifying the activity of what of the viscera that is the somatic effluent. Also, from the viscera, we have sensory receptors, and the sensory receptors are going to send their information through autonomic efferents, through autonomic efferents to the brain and spinal cord. The third division of the nervous system is the sense or the is known as the enteric nervous system, is known as the enteric nervous system. The enteric nervous system is controlling the activity of a smooth muscle glandes and endocrine cells of the gastrointestinal tract. It is formed of two plexuses present inside the wall of the gastrointestinal tract. It has motor supply of smooth, mu smooth muscle glands and endocrine cells and also these cells which is present inside the gastrointestinal tract sends afferent impulses and sensory impulses are carried to the brain and spinal cord and also controlling the activity of the enteric nervous system and also controlling the activity of the enteric nervous system. Anatomical classification of the central nervous system we mentioned previously it is formed of central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. If we look to the central nervous system it is formed of the brain and the spinal cord brain and spinal cord. The brain include the cerebrum, diencephalon, which include subsalamus, salamus, and hypothalamus, cerebellum, and brain stem that's formed of midbrain, bones, and medulla oblongata. So we have the cerebrum, the diencephalon, the cerebellum, midbrain, bones, and medulla oblongata. 
The second part of the central nervous system is the spinal cord that includes eight cervical segments, 12 thoracic segments, five lumbar segments, five sacral segments, and one coccygeal. And from the spinal cord, we have 31 pairs of crane spinal nerves, 31 pairs of spinal nerves arising from it. We have here the different parts of the brain and the function and their function. We have the cerebral cortex. It receives the sensory information. It sends message to move skeletal muscles. It integrates incoming and outcoming nerve impulse, perform activities such as thinking, learning, and remembering. We have multiple sensory areas distributed in the cerebral cortex. In the occipital loop, we have an area for the receiving of the visual information. In the temporal loop, we have area for receiving sounds and auditory information. In the parietal loop, we have an area that's concerned with the perception of the somatic sensation like touch, pressure, and vibration. Here in the frontal loop, we have an area which is called the motor area, and this motor area produces regulation of your voluntary movement. The activities such as the control of behavior, the, the formation of memories, the formation, formation of thoughts are produced by different areas in the cerebral cortex. Then we have group of nuclei called basal ganglia. This group of nuclei include a nucleus called codate, another one called butamin, another one called globus pallidus, subsalamic nucleus, substantia nigra. These nuclei are known as the basal ganglia. They are located lateral to the salamus, that is the salamus, and lateral to the salamus we have what? We have here the basal ganglia. This basal ganglia function is to reproduce regulation of the voluntary movement, the production of skilled movement, the formation of something we name it as the cognitive function of the brain. Or the meaning of the cognitive function of the brain is to produce transformation of the thoughts into motor acts to translate the idea into a motor act that's the function of the basal ganglia. Also, the basal ganglia produce inhibition or uh, re prevention of unwanted movement, like swinging of the arm during walking. Sometimes you would like to disinhibit this movement, you prevent it. Also, it is essential for the production of facial expressions and regulation of muscle tone. Then we have the salamus, and the salamus is considered as a relay station. What's the meaning of relay station? Any sensory information, either somatic sensation, auditory sensation, or visual sensation, are relayed in the salamus before reaching to the cerebral cortex. Before reaching to the cerebral cortex. Also, it interprets sensory messages such as those of pain, temperature, and pressure. It produces interpretation of some of the sensory information. Hypothalamus or the center of homeostasis. The center of homeostasis was the meaning of center of homeostasis. It produces regulation or regulation of the body temperature, regulation of the total body water, regulation of food intake, regulation of the endocrine nervous system or in, of the hormones, regulation of the autonomic nervous system, regulation of the blood glucose, regulation of the circadian rhythm. All these functions are produced by the hypothalamus. Cerebellum has a role in production of what? In production of the skilled movement, has a role in the regulation of the muscle tone, posture, and balance. And if we go to the brain stem, midbrain, bones, and medulla oblongata, we have in the midbrain and the bones and the medulla oblongata, we have functions, we have group of nuclei that can control what? That control salivation, that control the heartbeat and the respiration, that control the reflexes regulating the movement of the eye pole. It has a role in the consciousness or the production of alertness and it transmits impulses between brain and spinal cord. Functional organization of the cerebral cortex. The specific types of sensory, motor, and integrative signals are processed in a certain regions of the cerebral cortex. We mentioned previously that the cerebral cortex is formed of multiple areas. We have an area called gyri, gyri and these gyri are elevations and in between we have fissures named sulci 
these areas are either producing sensory, motor, or integrative function. So the areas of the cerebral cortex are classified into either sensory area that receive and interpret sensory impulses like area 3, 1, and 2 that is receive the somatic sensation from the opposite side of the body. We have area 17 that produce reception or receiving the visual information. We have the primary auditory area, primary auditory area, area 41 and 42, that receives the auditory information, that receive the auditory information. These are known as primary sensory areas, primary sensory areas. So what's the function of these sensory areas? Receives and interpret sensory impulses. Motor areas, motor areas that control the execution of voluntary movement. We have here motor area 4, that is a primary motor area. This means that all the muscles of your body are coordinated mainly by what? By the area 4. We have another area which is called the area 6 or the premotor area. Premotor area. And what is the function of the premotor area? The premotor area is the production of the complex movements. The production of complex movements. The movement is that require the interaction of multiple group of muscles at the same time. Then we have association areas, association areas, and these association areas are considered with the production of the integrative function, the understanding of meaning of sensation, the uh, motion, the generation of memory, emotions, reasoning, judgment, and personality. All these are functions mediated by the association areas. The somatic Sensory motor maps are a specific area in the cerebrum that relate body parts to cortical areas by receiving sensory input and provide motor output. So the somatic, sensory, and the motor maps are specific areas in the cerebrum in the cerebrum that relate body parts to cortical areas by receiving sensory input and provide motor output. Each area has a specific function. For example, area 3, 1, and 2 are producing what are producing? They are the site of relay or the site of termination or the site of receiving all the types of somatic sensation. That means that when I am going to touch your skin, for example, in your right hand, what's going? We are going to stimulate the left primary somatic sensory area. We are going to stimulate the left primary somatic sensory area. If you have a lesion in this area, you cannot perceive the sensation. You will not feel this sensation. So that is a function of each part. Each part has a specific function. So according to this, the cerebral cortex is classified into what? Into first classification according to the function, sensory areas like the primary somatic sensory areas, motor area like the primary motor area 4 so each area has its specific function then we have another classification then we have another classification here according to what according to the map according to the map what's the meaning of the mapping within a portion of the cortex that manage a specific function either it is a motor or somatic sensation or hearing or vision the part of the body has something which is called a special map into the cortex in an orderly way. This means that if we look here to the primary somatic sensory area, the body is represented in the primary somatic sensory area or half of the body is represented in the primary somatic sensory area. For example, that is the left hemisphere, that is the right hemisphere, that is the right primary somatic sensory area. In the right primary somatic sensory area, we have what? We have the representation of the left side of the body. We have representation of the left side of the body. And the body is represented upside down. The head and face is present in the lower part where the legs and feet or the foot are represented in the upper part and on the medial surface of the cerebral cortex. Each area has a specific representation in the primary somatic sensory area.
homunculus what's the meaning of homunculus that means that the representation of the different parts of the body in the primary somatic sensory area and in the primary motor area the body is represented upside down here in the motor area we are controlling the activity of skeletal muscles and here we are receiving the somatic sensation from the half of the body and we will find that the body is represented upside down in both areas the body is represented upside down head and face are presented in the lowermost part of the primary somatic sensory area and the primary motor area while the trunk and foot are represented on the uppermost or in the upper part on the medial surface of the cerebral areas the association areas we classify the areas of the brain into sensory areas, motor areas, and association areas. We have areas, we have areas that not, don't produce either sensory or motor functions. They produce understanding of the meaning of sensations. They are producing interpretation of information. They are producing memory. They are controlling the behavior. These are called the association areas. Example of the association area, the prefrontal cortex, the frontal association area that control the personality or regulate the personality. Somato sensory association area. Somato sensory association area. What is the meaning of the somato or what is the function of the somato sensory area? It produces understanding of the meaning of somatic sensation. Understanding the meaning of somatic sensation. If I put a key or a mobile or a coin in your hand and you are closing your eyes, while your eyes are closed, what's going? You can identify the name of the object. You can identify the texture of the object. You can identify the shape of the object. You can un understand the meaning of this the sensation by what? By the somatosensory area or the somatosensory association area. This area, if you have a damage in this area, you have something called a stereognosis. A stereognosis means you cannot identify the name of the object with closed eyes. You cannot identify the name of the object with closed eyes. Visual association area, understanding of the meaning of the visual information. Understanding of the meaning of the visual information. Facial recognition area, auditory association area, for understanding the meaning of spoken words. Or B to frontal cortex. Or B to frontal cortex, that is the regulation of behavior, regulation of behavior. Vernix area is a posterior language area, it is a higher intellectual area in your brain. Common integrative area, premotor area for the production of complex movements. Frontal eye field area that produces regulation of the movement of the eyeball, regulation of the muscles that control the movement of the eyeball. Integrative function of the cerebrum include sleep and wakefulness, learning, memory, emotional responses. Speech and language. Speech and language. Speaking and understanding. Speaking and Understanding language are complex activities that involve several sensory association and motor areas of the cortex. So it requires the interaction between sensory and association and motor areas of the cortex. In 97% of the population, the language areas are located in the left hemisphere which is the dominant hemisphere because most of the people or most of the population are right-handed. This means that their dominant cerebral hemisphere is the left cerebral hemisphere. So again, the speaking and understanding of the meaning of words is mainly produced by what? By the interaction between sensory association and motor areas. For example, if you would like to ask ourselves how the process of speech started or how can I produce language production or speech. We have either visual information, 
visual information in the form of written words or we have auditory information in the form of spoken words for example if you are going to respond to what if you are going to respond to spoken words what's happened you have sensory information coming from your ears and this information will be delivered and reach to the primary auditory area primary auditory area primary auditory area receives the auditory information but without understanding in order to understand the meaning of these words you have to pass the information to the auditory association area which is area 22 area 22 understand the meaning of spoken words and then it's going to pass the information that you understand to the vernix area the vernix area which is a higher intellectual area area 39 and 40 area 39 and 40 that is the vernix area this vernix area this vernix area is the area of the higher intellectual function this area is going to produce what produce of how you are going to respond are you going to respond by speaking or by writing by speaking or by writing also they are going to detect what are the types of words you are going to use and arrange these words in a meaningful speech in a meaningful way allowing you to produce something understandable to produce arrangement of the words then if you are going to respond by speaking the information coming from vernix area will pass to another area which is called broca's area area known as broca's area this broca's area produce regulation of the muscles of speech produce regulation of muscles of speech or the muscles that control the production of sound like muscles of the larynx muscles of the tongue muscles of lips muscles of the face so what's going after vernix area the site you are going to respond by speaking the air brocus area controls the activity of the muscles and produce the speech or producing the words so again it includes sensory areas auditory areas that pass information to vernix areas and vernix area is going to send the information to produce the response by what by the broca's area if you are going to respond to written words written words the primary visual area receive then pass the information to the visual association area to understand visual association area after standing pass the information to vernix area and vernix area if you are going to respond by writing will pass the information to the eye movement to the uh, uh, hand movement or the area that produce regulation of the muscles of the hand if you are going to respond by speaking if you are going to respond by speaking the information will pass again to the broca's area so at your level we are going to detect or to focus in two main areas the broca's area broca's area are named according to a certain neurosurgeon whose name is paul broca paul broca was a neurosurgeon and he was following a patient with difficulty in speech and when this subject died he got his brain and make a pathological examination of the brain and found that the lesion is present in this area or in this region so it is named according to his name it is named according to the subject who discovered if someone has a difficulty in his speech this means that he has a damage in this area or in broca's area located in the prefrontal and motor areas it is the skilled motor pattern of control of the larynx, lips, mouth, respiratory system, and other accessory muscles of speech are all initiated from this area. So this area are controlling the production of sound by controlling the muscles of speech. Vernix area. 
located in the temporal loop of the dominant hemisphere. This area interprets the meaning of speech by recognizing spoken words is active as you translate words into thoughts. Physia. Physia means an ability to use or to comprehend words. Ability to use or to comprehend words. Damage to Broca's area result in non-fluent aphasia. Damage to Broca's area result in non-fluent aphasia or motor aphasia. And an ability to properly articulate or form words. This means knowing what they wish to say but unable to say it. A person is capable of deciding what he or she wants to say but cannot make the vocal system emit words instead of noises. So, the subject has a difficulty in regulating the muscles that produce the speech, so they can express themselves by writing. If you ask him to write what you are weighing, what you are feeling, what would you like to say, he can write. But what is the problem? The problem is in the articulation of words. Damage of the association area, vernix area, result in affluent aphasia. In affluent aphasia characterized by faulty understanding of spoken or written words. A person might hear perfectly well and even recognize different words, but still unable to arrange these words into a coherent thought. Likewise, the person may be able to read words from the printed page, but be unable to recognize the thought that's conveyed. It has an effect in the comprehension of the meaning of words. That is the circuits coming from the auditory area to the association area to vernix area and then to the broca's area that control the muscles of speech. The same from the written words from the visual cortex to the vernix area and from vernix area to the broca's area that control the muscles of speech. So, speaking for heard word, here is speaking a written word. Cerebellum, in general, the cerebellum or the little brain is the second largest part of the brain. Its main function is the smooth coordination of skilled movement, balance and encephalon include the salamus, main relay station for sensory information going to cerebral cortex, main relay station for sensory information going to the cerebral cortex, motor information from the cerebellum to the motor cortex. This means all the types of information passing to the cerebral cortex should relate to the salamus. From the cerebellum to the motor cortex and from the ascending sensory tracts to the cerebral cortex. Hypothalamus, main regulator of homeostasis, control of autonomic nervous system, regulation of eating and drinking, Control of body temperature, regulation of the circadian rhythm, regulation of emotions. The thalamus contains pineal gland which produces hormone melatonin and it is released during darkness to initiate or promote sleeping. Brain waves. What is the meaning of the brain wave? We have billions of neurons or the neurons interacting together and the activity of these neurons needed to be recorded, needed to be recorded. And if we would like to record this activity, we have to put electrodes over the skin of the scalp and we connect them by a special way to record this activity. And the recording is known as the electro 
انكيفالوجرام ذا الكترو انكيفالوجرام الكترو انكيفالوجرامز ار يوزفول بوث ان ستادينج نورمال برين فانكشن ساتش از ذا تشينجز ذات اوكير ديورينج سليب اند ان دايجنوزيس اوف ا فارايتي اوف برين ديسوردرز دايجنوزيس اوف ا فارايتي اوف برين ديسوردرز ساتش از ابيليبسي تيومرز تروما هيماتومز ميتابوليك ابنورماليتيز and even detection of the site of trauma and the degenerative diseases. So the electrical recording or the recording of the electrical activity of the brain, the recording of the electrical activity of the brain is known as the electroencephalogram. The electroencephalogram. It helps to study the activity of normal brain function, study of the normal brain function, as well as changes that occur during sleep, and also in the diagnosis of a variety of brain disorders. Diagnosis of a variety of brain disorders. Electroencephalogram is also utilized to determine if life is present, that is to establish or confirm that brain this has occurred. It is also helpful in the diagnosis of what? Of brain this. Types of brain waves. Types of brain waves. Brain waves include alpha waves and its frequency 10 to 12 cycles per second or hertz, and they are present when you are awake and appear during sleep. So, alpha waves are recorded in awake subject with closed eyes. In awake subject with closed eyes and appear during sleep. Beta waves. Beta waves are recorded when the subject open his eyes, awake and open his eyes. The alpha waves change it into a beta wave, and they are present with sensory input and mental activity. Sensory input and mental activity. So it is usually recorded when the nervous system is active. So alpha wave is recorded when you are in a state of wakefulness with closed eyes. If you change your closed state of or the eyes change it from the closed state to open state we record what we record beta waves beta waves are characterized by high frequency high frequency 14 to 30 hertz or cycle per second it is the highest in frequency then we have theta and delta waves they are slow waves slow waves theta 4 to 7 hertz and usually it indicates emotional stress or a brain disorder it indicates emotional stress or a brain disorder. Delta waves, it is the lowest in frequency, lowest in frequency, 1 to 5 hertz, appear only during sleep in adults, but indicates brain damage in awake adults. If it appears in awake adults, it indicates brain damage. That is the four waves that is recorded from your brain. Alpha, beta, theta, and delta, and significance. We have two hemispheres, so we have something which is called the hemispheric lateralization or the dominance of the hemisphere. As we know, 90% of the people are right-handed. This means that their dominant cerebral hemisphere is the left hemisphere. The two hemispheres are usually anatomically the same, are usually anatomically the same, and they share some of the functions, share some of the function. But if we look specifically, there are some anatomical and physiological differences. Each hemisphere is specialized in performing certain unique function, a feature known as hemispheric lateralization. For example, in the right-handed people, the dominant cerebral hemisphere is the left cerebral hemisphere. This means that the area is specific for movement of the hand, the hand movement area, the area that produce killed the movement of the hands are usually present in the left hemisphere. The broca's area is usually present in the dominant hemisphere, in the left hemisphere. So, if we look in most people, the left hemisphere is more important for what? They look that or they found that it is important for reasoning, numerical and scientific skills, spoken and written language. So, most of the people with the left hemisphere, the dominant hemisphere, are good in what? In numerical and scientific skills. They are good in reasoning. They are good in the uh, speaking. 
while the right hemisphere is more specialized for the arts like music and artistic awareness and the production of 3D shapes, the drawing, the discrimination of different uh, smells, generating mental image. All these are functions of the right hemisphere. Brain blood flow. Blood flow to the brain occurs via the internal carotid and the vertebral arteries. The venous drainage comes from the internal jugular vein. The brain, in spite of being about 2% of the total body weight, it consumes 20% of the oxygen and the glucose at rest. Neurons synthesize ATP almost exclusively from glucose via reactions that use oxygen oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria. Blood flow interruption causes stroke. Brainstem, midbrain, bones, and medulla oblongata. Brainstem, midbrain, bones, and medulla oblongata. Receive sensory information and send out motor signals through the cranial nerves. Through what? The cranial nerves. Contains important control centers for the autonomic nervous system, like the cardiac acceleratory center, cardiac inhibitory centers, the center that controls activity of the gastrointestinal tract. All these are important centers for the control of the activity of the autonomic nervous system. Contains a loosely organized interconnected collection of neurons and fibers called the reticular formation. We have group of nuclei present in between the medulla oblongata and bones. These nuclei are known as the reticular formation. And what's the function of the reticular formation? Reticular formation are concerned with the production of consciousness, the state of alertness. The medulla is involved in regulating the vital functional centers like the cardiovascular center that control heart rate, force of contraction, the diameter of the blood vessels through the vasomotor center or the vasoconstrictor center. It also controls or contains the respiratory resmicity center, which is a dorsal respiratory group. Bones contains the apneustic center and pneumotaxic center. The reticular formation or the consciousness. We have here a group of neurons distributed between the bones and the medulla oblongata. These group of neurons are known as the reticular formation. These neurons have something which is called inherent intrinsic activity. Inherent intrinsic activity. They are forming a network of neurons and this network of neurons send signals to the salamus, send signals to the salamus and then the salamus are going to send impulses to the whole cerebral cortex. So they are going to activate all the cerebral cortex. So much of the brainstem consists of a net-like arrangement of neuronal cell bodies and small bundles of myelinated axons known as the reticular formation. These are the neurons that form the reticular formation. It have an ascending and a descending tracks. Ascending tracks go to the different areas of the cerebral cortex. Descending tracks go to the spinal cord. Go to the spinal cord. The ascending portion of this network is called the reticular activating system and consists of a sensory axon that project to the cerebral cortex. The ascending portion of this network is called the reticular activating system and consists of a sensory axon that project to the cerebral cortex. The reticular activating system function to maintain consciousness and a state of wakefulness. Consciousness and a state of wakefulness in which an individual is fully alert, aware, and oriented. So, when the articular activating system are activated, 
as by auditory information or by ascending somatic sensation, what's going? The reticular activating system becomes active and then it activates all the cerebral cortex. So this can transform you from the sleeping state into the alert state or a wakefulness state. So when you are sleeping and you hear someone calling you, what's happened? you get alert. How can this occur? This occur by the auditory information passing to the reticular activating system, activating it so the cerebral cortex is going to be activated as a whole and you are transformed from the sleeping state to the alert state. Also, if someone touches you while you are sleeping, there is an ascending somatic sensation. This ascending somatic sensation activates what activates the reticular activating system and when it activates the reticular activating system it produces what it produces activation of the cerebral cortex transforming you from what from the sleeping state to the alert state then we have something which is called a reverberating circuit reverberating circuit what's the meaning there is a closed circuit between the cerebral cortex and the reticular activating system F feedback impulses coming from the cerebral cortex continues the activation of the reticular activating system. So you are going into a continuous state of alertness for 16 to 18 hours, for 16 to 18 hours to produce what? To produce maintenance of the alert state or the wakefulness state. So we have something like a positive feedback mechanism or a closed circuit of activation between the reticular activating system and cerebral cortex. Cerebral cortex activates the reticular activating system and this is continuous until there is depletion of the neurotransmitter. There is depletion of the neurotransmitter. When the neurotransmitters are depleted, when the neurotransmitters are depleted, you transform it from the alert state to the sleeping state and in this condition you are going to form more neurotransmitters during sleep. Activation of the reticular activating system produces sleep, a state of partial consciousness from which an individual can be aroused. Activation of the reticular activating system produces sleep. The reticular activating system also prevents sensory overload. It acts as a relay station or a gate state. It can block the information or prevent the overstimulation of the cerebral cortex. It can produce something like controlling of the amount of impulses reaching to the cerebral cortex. So we can name it as a gate station or a relay station that can prevent sensory overload. This usually occur when you are exposed to a severe painful stimuli. Severe painful stimuli. We have a system known as the pain control system. Pain control system. What's the meaning of a pain control system? It's a special system that blocks the passage of the sensory information or decreases the stimulation of the cerebral cortex. The spinal cord. Spinal cord is a part of the nervous system. And if we look to the spinal cord. It has a dorsal horn and ventral horn. Dorsal horn, ventral horn. Usually the dorsal horn is the sensory gate or all the types of sensory information entering to the spinal cord are coming from the dorsal root or the posterior root to the dorsal horn or the posterior horn. And most of the motor are coming from the anterior horn or from the what from the ventral horn. So usually, the spinal nerves arising from the spinal cord has two roots. One is known as a posterior root and the other one is the anterior root. Dorsal root or ventral root. Dorsal horn inside the spinal cord, ventral horn. And if we look beside the spinal cord, we have a collection of cell bodies which are named, which is named as the dorsal root ganglia. Named as the dorsal root ganglia that contains the cell bodies the cell bodies of the sensory neurons. So each posterior root has a swelling, the posterior root ganglia, which contains the cell bodies of the sensory neurons. The anterior root and the rootlets contains axons of motor neurons. So 
from the anterior root we have the axons of the motor neurons and the anterior horn contains their cell buds so the cell buds of sensory neurons are located in the dorsal root ganglia the cell buds of the motor neurons are located in the anterior horn or in the ventral horn the white matter axons of the cord consists of million of nerve fiber which transmits electrical information between limb trunk and organs of the body and the brain that is the gray matter which is formed of h shaped two dorsal horns and two ventral horns we have surrounding a white matter that contains the axons that contains the axons and these axons may be an ascending tract or the descending tract ascending carrying sensory information descending carrying motor information the gray matter is made up mainly of the nerve cell bodies its function is to integrate the incoming and outgoing information. Processing of sensory input and motor output of the spinal cord. If we look to the cross section of the spinal cord, spinal cord receives the sensory information from sensory receptors, from sensory receptors. And these receptors send their sensory information along the afferent neurons. Cell bodies of the afferent neurons are located here in the dorsal root ganglia. And then the central or branches of these sensory neurons are passing inside the spinal cord. And they may ascend to higher levels like in the special pathway called the dorsal column the medial meniscus system. Or it may synapse with interneurons and these interneurons and these interneurons may control the activity of the motor neurons of the anterior horn, or it may ascend in another tracks to the higher areas or the higher levels of the central nervous system. We have here the descending tracks that bring the motor information from the higher motor areas, synapsing with the anterior horn cells that control the activity of the skeletal muscles. And also we have here autonomic neurons that control the activity of the viscera. We have here the autonomic neurons that control the activity of the viscera. So the spinal cord is a highway for nerve impulse propagation. Either ascending signals, ascending information for sensory information or descending, descending information for motor information. It is a site for many reflexes. The site of reflex center or the regulation of reflexes is produced by the spinal cord and as we know the cerebral cortex white matter contains something called the tract and the tracts are bundle of neuronal axons bundle of neuronal axons that's either conveying or carrying sensory information or carrying motor information sensory information in ascending tracts like the Anterolateral system like the dorsal column, the medial meniscus system, or motor descending tracts like the pyramidal tracts. They are bundles of neuronal axons that located in a specific area in the spinal cord, and they are present in specific areas in the spinal cord, and they have a specific function, either sensory function or motor function.